What did you do next? Yeah, what's that? Oh, man. Oh, man. Okay, why don't we get started? Uh, uh, it's great to see. Uh, for those of you watching on TV, there's an almost full auditorium here. <laughs> so you're missing out. <laughs> and uh, obviously, everyone is very interested in this, our, our next speaker's talk. So I, it's my great pleasure to introduce one of our own, Professor Catherine Zurich, who uh, joined the faculty at Caltech. Uh, in 2019, right before the pandemic. <laughs> and so I actually haven't met her yet <laughs> in person. So, uh, but uh, uh, she, uh, like many uh, excellent scientists, was uh, comes from the Midwest <laughs> and uh, was uh, uh, went to a small college in Minnesota. And then um, the uh, University of Washington in Seattle, uh, PhD in 2006. Then she has several distinguished uh, positions, postdocs, SRAM fellow uh, at a variety of places. She became an assistant professor at University of Michigan in 2009, uh, uh, associate professor at, in 2013. She then went to Berkeley and particularly the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. Um, and then uh, she also was a fellow, of the, uh, elected a fellow of the American Physical Society in 2017 and joined us, as I said before, in 2019, uh, where she is uh, pursuing uh, here and previously a very interesting career studying uh, new, new models of dark matter and how they may be tested by astrophysical observations, as well as tabletop experiments. Uh, and recently she was last year named a Simon's um, investigator, uh, which is a very high honor as well. So it's with great pleasure that I, I give you uh, Professor Catherine Zurich. Okay, so thanks so much for the introduction and the invitation to give this talk. I'm excited to be here. <laughs> Uh, I had originally been scheduled to come give this talk in, um, well, the spring of last year. <laughs> so <laughs> here we are. Um, so I wanted to bridge really a broad range of topics um, because I wanna throw a bunch of ideas and directions that I'm thinking about or have thought about um, as hooks for further discussion. And I'm really doing this this way because it's my home institution. And I would love to start a conversation with all of you about um, things that I'm working on. So it's, I'm, I'm attempting here to be broad range, <laughs> broad band without being scattershot. So, um, so let's, uh, let's go down this path. So it's good always, I enjoy starting this talk just to remind ourselves since we're standing in front of such a big problem <laughs> of how far we've come in understanding the evolution of the universe. And the fact that we really need new physics beyond the standard model to understand the broad range of cosmological observations. So this comes from the time that the universe is a second old down to the measurements at the cosmic microwave background epoch to formation of structure, acceleration of the universe, galactic rotation curves, all these things fit together and really could be, can only be understood in the context of the cold dark matter paradigm. However, that said, this paradigm fits together with essentially no dark matter dynamics in the sense that it is maximally boring from a particle physics point of view, that the dark matter is cold, it needs to be highly non-relativistic, it's pressureless, which means that it just it dilutes with the volume of the universe as it expands. 
So really what we know in some sense about the dark matter is first and foremost, a test of the inflationary paradigm. And the fact that we can measure this matter power spectrum, now this, this plot is so old and so classic, I didn't even include a reference to, to the authors, but really what this tells us is that dark matter um, inflation seeds, these scale invariant density perturbations that just grow under the power of gravity and that allow all of the structure in the, uh, in the universe to form as we see it. There is comparatively little information about the details of dark matter microphysics. Now the fact, the abundance, how much we can weigh the universe so we know how much dark matter there is. We know that it has to be cold. We have limits on how much it can self-interact both with us and with the uh, dark sector itself. But so far, we can't uh, reconstruct the theory of dark matter the way we would like to be able to uh, with the standard model. So we have, uh, this picture where the standard model has a very detailed theory associated with it. It has all this dynamics, the matter and the gauge interactions, finally the Higgs boson, we know the mass scale. So if I think about the Y axis here as a mass scale and the X axis here is something like an accessibility. So the standard model sets some mass scale at the bottom of it, you have the proton mass the bottom of the um, baryonic sector, you have the proton mass. And then there's some barrier that separates us from the dark matter sector. We actually don't know how high that barrier is. We know at minimum, it has to communicate with us through gravity, which is the weakest force. And all the information that we have about the dark matter comes only via this very, very weak force. And so if you think about it, it's quite remarkable that we've been able to weigh it We've been able to learn, you know, at least on large scales, how it's, it, it collapses, okay? We, we know that it's pretty well approximated to be cold. We know that its self-interactions can't be too strong, but other than that, it's kind of a question mark. Now we have assumed that it's very simple, but there could in fact be dynamics in there. And we don't even actually know what this mass gap or this mass scale associated with whatever dynamics is sitting in the hidden sector is. Okay, so uh, particle physicists, at least traditionally, if we look back 30, 40 years, kind of collapse this discussion onto looking at dark matter near the weak scale. And uh, in fact, if you just look at what's astrophysically allowed, the mass range that's covered is from something like 10 to the minus 22 electron volts or 10 to the minus 23, there's some uncertainty on that all the way up to a thousand solar mass. So if you're a particle physicist who thinks about particle astrophysics, you know that a solar mass is about 10 to the 57 GeV. Okay, so you can count all the orders of magnitude that's allowed in that mass range. Most of the searches of dark matter up until about five to 10 years ago, focused on this narrow mass window around about hundred GeV. There were also uh, sort um, astrophysical candidates for dark matter, massive compact halo objects and black holes that have been mostly strongly constrained or ruled out. And so just to make a connection there, because this is really where a lot of the focus in the early days of dark matter searches was on some type of astrophysical explanation. And that's been pretty well covered. So um, at very low mass below about 10 to the minus 15 solar mass, Black holes would evaporate on the high end. You would be able to see them through the, the graininess and the power spectrum through the Lyman alpha forest. So there's a lot of different ways that that's constrained. And over much of the rest of the mass range, there's a whole bunch of different searches that constrain black holes as the dark matter. So on the y-axis here, this is the fraction of the dark matter that can be in such an object. Now, this is still an ongoing area of research and you hear people talk about shifting these, you know, especially where there seems like there might be a little window about whether you can lift those constraints just by the astrophysical uncertainties, but more or less, this is the picture. And so what we're focusing on is physics beyond the standard model. And as I said earlier, the physics beyond the standard model that we've mostly been focused on is the weak scale. And I don't wanna denigrate this focus because I think it's a really good place to start. And the basic reason is that the weak forces, well, first of all, they're known. 
and they have the right scale for detection, which is important for learning something about the microphysical nature, for the abundance, and for the cosmology. So just to do a little bit of naive dimensional analysis here to kind of set the scales that are going to recur several times throughout this discussion, this interaction, a typical weak interaction cross-section, has a weak coupling constant. It has a reduced mass between the dark matter particle, which is always going to be x, and whatever the target is. Okay, so oftentimes this is a nucleon or a nucleus in a direct detection experiment, and then it's mediated via the weak force around 100 GeV. So that comes out to be about 10 to the minus 34 centimeters squared. It's actually smaller than that because this reduced mass brings the cross section down more into the 10 to the minus 38 centimeters uh, scale. So I said that this weak kind of cross section is about right for setting the abundance. So that back of the envelope is also pretty easy to do because the process that sets the macroscopic amount of dark matter that we see in the universe happens through a microscopic process. It's dark matter annihilating to produce some pair of standard model particles through some interaction, which is mediated by the weak force. And so you can compute the amount of dark matter so they annihilate until you have so few of them that they can't find each other to annihilate anymore. This is the standard freeze out calculation. So you compute the rate of the annihilation. It goes like the number density times this microscopic interaction cross section. And then you set it equal to the Hubble expansion when they can no longer find each other. And uh, this, because you measure the amount of dark matter in the universe, sets uh, an annihilation cross section, which you might want to remember is about 10 to the minus 26 centimeter cube per second. So now you go back to that back of the envelope that I just presented on the previous page. You take that cross section, you multiply it by the speed of light because they're just starting to become non-relativistic when they freeze out. And the answer is about 10 to the minus 24 centimeter cube per second for 100 GeV dark matter. So when you talk about dark matter being at the weak scale, what we really mean it's about dark matter that's a couple of TeV. Turns out to be the right number, okay? And this is, uh, I think, very powerful motivation to look for dark matter with mass around a couple of TeV. And um, this, in fact, is what the LHC program is aiming for. Actually does not have an amazing direct sensitivity to um, weak dark matter, which would be the subject of another talk. It's the, um, the target of direct detection experiments, looking for dark matter at the weak scale, which we'll talk briefly about later on. But we're going, you know, we're still looking for this candidate and it's still viable. Now, it has astrophysical impacts that have uh, deeply formed the way that we look for dark matter in astrophysics. And it's the fact that I alluded to earlier, which is that dark matter is boring in the WIMP paradigm because it annihilates, it freezes out, it has its relic abundance, it expands with the, as the universe expands, you know, dilutes. And that's about all it does. You might be able to see it through its annihilation. Maybe if you look towards the center of the galaxy, there are, there are searches ongoing for that. But in general, um, in order to have some uh, impact on structure formation at large scales, and when I say large scales, I mean galactic scales are larger, the interaction cross-section actually needs to be bigger, much bigger, 10 to the minus 24 centimeters squared per GeV. So you recall earlier I said weak interaction cross-sections are not really bigger than 10 to the minus 34. And so this is really just way too big. So, so in terms of what we see in the universe, it's just not relevant for the formation of structure. And so gravity really does all the work for us. However, this is on large scales. On smaller scales, this isn't really true. In fact, it's not true. Okay. On smaller scales, we expect dark matter standard model interactions to lead to the damping of inflationary perturbations. Okay. So the way to think about that is um, dark matter in the early universe, the temperature is high. Weak interactions are not weak at high temperatures. So there's rapid scattering between the dark matter and the baryons. And that proceeds until the universe drops to a low enough temperature that that scattering, not just the annihilation, but the scattering process decouples. 
And so as long as there's that strong scattering process, that's gonna erase the inflationary, bun um, the inflationary perturbations. So if you look at the co-moving scale as a function of time, there's this cosmological goodbye and hello again effect to quote Colvin Turner, where a perturbation of a given scale leaves the horizon and then eventually after reheating it enters again. And so the, the question is whether that perturbation is inside or outside the horizon when kinetic decoupling occurs. Okay. If it's inside, the perturbations are gone. I'm not going to have any structure at all. If it's, under, if, it's, uh, if it's outside, then I'm going to just have the ordinary inflationary story go on uninterrupted. So you can calculate this. And the decoupling temperature is actually very low. It's, um, you know, it's above an MeV, but not by very much. And so that corresponds to a minimum halo mass of about 10 to the minus six solar mass. So when you hear people talk about in simulations, testing the minimum halo mass, that is not a test of the CDM paradigm. That is a test of the WIMP paradigm. And it is, it is particular to the interactions of that, that paradigm, okay? It is not true in general. In general, I can have some hidden sector. It can be the case that dark matter doesn't reside here at the weak scale. It's perfectly viable to say be at a lighter mass scale. If it's at a lighter mass scale, the forces that mediate the scattering tend to decouple later. And so as a result, the typical mass scales where you're gonna erase those perturbations are larger. And so you can easily have a situation where this minimum mass could go all the way up to about what would be allowed with the Lyman alpha forest, which is on the order of something like 10 to the seventh solar mass. And typically what that corresponds to in terms of dark matter mass is you push this mass down from you know, a TeV scale down to an MeV. So that's about six orders of magnitude in mass. It's quite substantial. And in fact, you would be able to see now this damping of perturbations on much, much larger scales if you were able to measure the dark matter power spectrum on those scales, which we can't currently, okay? But which we're gonna talk about how you might be able to do that. So as I said, it impacts both direct detection and small scale structure observations. And I should say that as the dark matter mass drops below an MEV, typically the mechanism for setting its abundance is not through these thermal interactions that I've just been talking about where dark matter comes into equilibrium with the standard model. It has to be populated in some ways, some different way. I'm gonna talk about two right now that actually impact the way structure forms on small scales. So let me give you two kind of um, classic, relatively conservative examples. So uh, axion dark matter. So uh, axion dark matter originates from a complex scalar field with a structure of the potential, which is not so different from the one that the Higgs boson has. Mass scales are completely different, but it has this wine bottle potential. A difference with the Higgs boson is that in the angular direction, there is an actual potential here. And so what happens is in the early universe, initially the field is up here at the unbroken uh, part of the potential. And then as the universe cools, it rolls down and it picks out some direction in this potential. And that potential is not flat. So depending on where it happens to land, the local dark matter density is going to be different. And in particular, it depends on what the angle is here. So once you actually produce cold axion dark matter by the oscillations of this field about the minimum of the potential, what you get on very small scales is huge density perturbations. So here, if you plot the density perturbations as a function of the co-moving scale, so here's just a 2D slice. The only point I want you to take from this is that there are density fluctuations, which are order one, and in fact, even larger, and that they're, they're smooth on scales, which are the horizon size at the QCD phase transition, which happens at temperatures around a GeV. So what you do is you look at the mass of dark matter that's within the horizon 
at the QCD phase transition and you compute it, it's a little more subtle than that because the axion mass is actually just turning on as the QCD phase transition happens. And that allows you to compute uh, um, a halo mass function from the axion dark matter model. And so that's what's plotted here. This is a halo mass function as a, a function of the mass scale. And you can see that it's peaked actually down around 10 to the minus 15 solar mass. So here's one very classic, I would say from a particle physics um, point of view, simple mechanism where you see very large uh, amount of, of substructure, but on very, very small scales. In addition, because this, this um, over density starts out very large, the concentration parameters of these halos are very large. Okay, they're in excess of a thousand. These are much more dense than, than ordinary CDM halos. A second example, should have changed this to two, is the case of early matter domination. So quite generically, or in many models, I can have particles that are long-lived. And when they're long-lived, they don't, uh, they, they uh, become non-relativistic. They start to dominate the energy density in the universe and they cause matter domination to happen at temperatures way above the electrovolt scale where they do in the standard CDM picture. And so what that does is coming back to this picture is any uh, perturbation that enters the horizon when that early matter domination happens now starts to grow linearly, just like it does late in the universe. And so you can get in the, on top of the ordinary CDM. Uh, so this is as a function of scale. This is a stand-in for the halo. Well, this is the halo mass function. This is multiplied by F. But anyway, you can get these additional contributions that depend on the temperature at which that heavy state decays. So this is a very another very easy way to actually seed uh, structures. Um, again, very low mass structures. So your next question is, well, this is, a, this is a fingerprint of what's happening in the dark matter sector at very early times. Is there any way that I could possibly measure the matter power spectrum of dark matter and get some idea of whether there are substructures on those kinds of mass scales? And the fact of the matter is that on subgalactic scales, our current knowledge of the matter power spectrum, so these are the over densities, is actually quite limited. So, you know, we have very precise measurements with the CMB. We have less precise measurements, but still measurements with the Lyman Alpha Forest. And then as you go to higher wave number, we just currently have little to no information. So I want to spend a little bit of time um, proposing some ideas. Now, you know, I'm not going to say that we're going to be able to go out and do these measurements like next year. These are long term goals, but um, we need to spend more time thinking about how we probe the matter, spec matter power spectrum on these small scales so that we can learn something about the microphysical nature of the dark matter. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about PTAs, which is something I've been working on in the last few years. So here's a, um, a summary plot. Uh, to give you an idea of what could be done with pulsar timing arrays, I'm going to give you a few more details on the next slide. So on the y-axis here is the concentration, or it's actually the density, but it's the stand-in for the concentration parameter, is a function of the mass of the halo. And uh, so just to orient you, CDM has uh, halos that have concentrations in the tens. And um, so you can see now here are different types of PTA searches, okay? And what they could do, now this is a futuristic SKA type measurement where you're able to measure 100, you know, 100 plus pulsars over the time scale of decades. But you can see that in principle, now you can start to search for dark matter subhalos in that mass range. There have also been other proposals that I'm not going to talk about. We put them on this plot um, due to other people, and I encourage you to take a look at them if you're interested with uh, photometric and astrometric surveys that in the future are not quite as sensitive in terms of low concentration halos, but can also reach a similar mass range. 
So what's the idea with pulsar timing arrays? So here's my um, cartoon <laughs> that um, pulsars are really very stable clocks. And that's what we're interested in using them for that they uh, pulsars emit these pulses. They uh, arrive at the earth, we measure them. I shouldn't say I measure them, but uh, pulsar timing observationalists measure it. And there's a pulse phase. And the thing that's remarkable about it is that they fluctuate, but they don't accumulate, okay? It's a good approximation that um, we can measure this pulsar over decades in some cases, and I can fit it with just some fixed uh, number, uh, the period, and with the first derivative of the period. That's all that you need <laughs> to <laughs> actually predict the time of arrival of the pulse over the time scale of decades, they're remarkably stable clocks. So the idea is that uh, these pulsars, of course, are not in an, in an empty environment. They're in the environment of dark matter subhalos. And really uh, what happens is you can have a collection of these guys or a single one, and it can either pull on the pulsar or on the earth, or it can give rise to Shapiro delay. And those have typical time scales associated with these processes. And the question is whether they have a large enough amplitude that you can see these above the noise that they already uh, observe in their experiment. So we asked this question and we uh, teamed up with, at the end to get a more realistic picture, Steve Taylor, who's on Nanograph, to look at what you might be able to do in the future in terms of the fraction of the dark matter in a subhalo of mass M with um, an SKA type in instrument or in some very optimistic far future type scenario. You can see that this, you know, is not, granted we have not taken into account, for example, a supermassive black hole background, okay? Stochastic gravitational wave background, which will complicate this. But you can see that you have, at least um, at the theoretical level, sensitivity to um, dark matter that's, uh, that's at the level of the, of the density of dark matter that we observe. And that perhaps in the far future, we may really be able to nail this down. Now, as I said, there is um, in nanograv, there is evidence for a stochastic process in their data, which they have fit by um, a cosmological population of supermassive black holes that are merging. And uh, the, the fit, you know, this is the prediction of the model here and the amplitude, which is you know, a little on the high side from what the theory would have predicted, but actually in quite good agreement. And so this um, fits well, it's gonna be a background to a potential dark matter signal. I wanted to add one more comment because I'm throwing hooks out there is that even though, you know, from a um, Occam's razor point of view, perhaps the most likely one is the astrophysical one, dark sectors actually also would generate a signal that could look like this. So the idea is that some, something that would be analogous to the QCD phase transition, but strongly first order could generate gravitational waves. Depending on what the temperature of that phase transition is, you'll generate different frequency gravitational waves. And it'll have an amplitude that in general is large enough to be observed either with PTAs if the phase transition is low enough, or for example, with LISA at higher frequencies, higher temperatures for the phase transition. So you can go and ask the question, is the nanograv data equally well fit by um, a hidden sector phase transition? And the answer to that question, at least right now, seems to be yes. That in fact, you can generate that stochastic gravitational wave background with a phase transition temperature around one to 10 MeV. Uh, and then this is a parameter that um, tells you about the strength of the, of the gravitational waves of the phase transition that's uh, generating the stochastic background. So we'll have to see as time goes on, get more precise frequency information, whether one can actually distinguish between an astrophysical source of, of such a, a background and a, um, a, a new physics explanation 
uh, of the background. So that's all I'm gonna say about PTAs. And I would just like to remind you that everything that I've said so far is utilizing only gravity. And what we're taking advantage of is gravitational coherence. So you're making these measurements. The question is really, how well can I weigh two objects and look for uh, the formation of structure on some scale? However, this information is necessarily coarse grain as it has to take advantage of that coherence of summing over many, many dark matter particles to be able to get a signal that's large enough to be detected through a mediator, which is the gravitational force. The reconstruction of the fundamental theory is necessarily indirect. So it might be the case that if eventually you can reconstruct the halo mass function to small scales, that um, you'll be able to determine what the theory of dark matter is. But you're not gonna be able to detect an individual dark matter particle this way. You're not gonna be able to reconstruct the Lagrangian, the fundamental theory, the kind of information that, that particle physicists want for a complete theory. Uh, so I'm gonna now come back to my earlier picture because I wanna transition into talking about the um, particle interactions of dark matter and ways that we could look for those. So I wanna start on the high mass end. So before we were looking at this window from about an MeV up to the TeV scale, and once you get above a few TeV, and you're looking at this window all the way up to about a thousand solar mass, um, setting the relic abundance in this win window through the interactions with the standard model is challenging. Okay, and the reason for that is again coming back to our back of the envelope estimate. The weak this rate for um, setting the relic abundance. Now, if we just take this cross section. And we look at it, as you push this mass scale up, this drops. And remember the number that we needed to set the relic abundance was three times 10 to the minus 26 centimeter cube per second. So once this, cross, this mass scale gets much above a TeV, you just can't set it through the interactions with the standard model, at least not if the dark matter is thermalized. So at heavier masses, detection of this dark matter through the interactions with the standard model is generally not that well motivated, okay? So, um, so we wanna still look for astrophysical ways to um, determine something about the nature of the dark matter at these higher mass ranges. And I wanna give you one example of this because, um, because it's fun and quite generic. So let's imagine that in the hidden sector, I had a copy of the standard model but I removed electromagnetism, okay? This is, would be actually totally consistent with what we know, uh, but it would have a radical change in what we would see in the universe. And I just wanna do a little, another little back of the envelope estimate. So we know that the standard model nuclei, at least the light ones are synthesized when the universe is a second old at BBN. And so when you learn about BBN and taking a class, what you do is you solve a Boltzmann equation where you say that the um, synthesis of an, of an element of size capital N goes like some cross section, usually a geometric cross section times a relative velocity, and then the number density that's available. And there's some order one number here. Now, if you put in a cross section that's relevant to the standard model, which is dominated by the fact that there's a Coulomb barrier, you synthesize nuclei if you just do this simple back of the envelope, which is about nine and a half. And it's pretty darn good because we know in BBN we synthesize um, lithium seven, but nothing larger. So now let's just get rid of that Coulomb barrier and otherwise have the standard model physics proceed as it would otherwise. What do you synthesize? You synthesize actually huge nuclei, right? This would be con completely consistent with what we see in the universe. And the, and the consequence would be that you would have these huge nuclei sitting around, their cross sections would be large and they would quite generically interact with each other. And when they interact, they just like in the standard model, they would stick together, they would fuse, it would be a maximally dissipative process. And then they would ring down to the ground state by radiating off force mediators. So in the standard model, these are pions, 
if you have some hidden sector, this would be an analog of pions, which here we call a scalar phi. And so you can, you know, just ask this question and then compute what the model space is for this. And it turns out that there's a significant part of the model space where the interactions would be astrophysically relevant. And it would lead to new sources of dissipation and halos and potentially to core stability. Now, um, in general, we don't see halos destabilizing. But we also know that we have a population of halos. So not all halos do the same thing. There's a great diversity in the halos that we observe in the universe. So one thing you can think about is that we don't actually know how supermassive black holes are formed in the very early universe at redshift say of six. So one thing you can ask is whether this type of dissipative uh, dark matter could cause an instability that would seed supermassive black holes in the early universe, but would still be consistent with what we observe at low redshifts. And uh, in order to look at this, what needs to happen is that you need to have massive halos that at high redshift would um, destabilize, but they should be relatively rare high density halos. And that actually allows you to fix a preferred interaction cross section for this process. And so then you can look at the, uh, hal the halo mass function of the supermassive black holes, okay? At say 10 to the nine solar mass that you would like to understand at a redshift of six and see whether this type of dark, dark matter model could quite easily and naturally do this. So um, Phil Hopkins student, Jacob Shen, and another student who's working with me, Huang Yu Xiao, looked at this and it turns out, I think, there was maybe some skepticism initially, but this actually works quite nicely uh, to see the formation of supermassive black holes in the early universe. So backing up for a minute and thinking about models of dark matter that you know, are quite simple to construct from a theoretical point of view, but are not the standard WIMP can actually give rise to radically different astrophysical predictions. And so you should always be asking yourself this question, how much am I biased? by the CDM paradigm, where there aren't any relevant dark matter dynamics. Okay, so uh, in the remaining time, I wanna talk a little bit about um, direct detection. So I'm coming back to this plot. So I said up here, the inter it's really not very motivated to look for dark matter through its interactions with the standard model. Um, through its relic abundance, because the cross sections are just too small. They're suppressed by one on the mass squared. And in general, uh, um, at least from the relic abundance point of view, not really motivated to look in direct detection experiments. On the other hand, if you go to slightly lower masses, the cross sections can actually be enhanced relative to the weak scale cross sections. But they're actually not detectable with the suite of experiments that were designed to look for dark matter at the weak scale. So there's a giant hole in looking for these low mass hidden sector dark matter models. And I wanna emphasize that these models arise generically uh, in top-down constructions. Okay. So to make, another, to make this point again, the dark sector dynamics are complex and astrophysically relevant. So um, the interaction cross section now, again, doing the naive dimensional analysis estimate, turns out to be about 10 to the minus 24 uh, centimeters squared if the mass scale is around a GeV. So this is a cross section that again, would be on the scale that would modify halo shapes. And the abundance can still naturally be set by the interactions with the standard model. And so this motivates new classes of terrestrial hidden sector searches. So 15 years ago, none of these experiments existed. Okay? People weren't thinking about this, but in the last five years, now there have been a suite of experiments um, in colliders and also in direct detection that have been designed precisely to look for dark matter with mass just below the electroweak scale. And um, it would be a lot of fun to spend some time talking about these um, accelerator-based searches 
that are looking for dark matter hidden sectors via rel relatively low mass mediators. But again, making an editorial choice, we're not gonna talk about that. We're gonna focus on direct detection experiments. So the direct detection experiments that look for the WIMP focus on a process where dark matter scatters elast elastically off of nuclei and deposits a significant fraction of its energy. And uh, one of the reasons why that works well is because weak scale dark matter is actually kinematically well matched to nuclei. So if I have dark matter, which is say 100 GeV to one TeV, typical heavy nuclei are around 100 GeV. And so it turns out that that is a good kinematic match for extracting a lot of the dark matter kinetic energy. And so these direct detection experiments now look for dark matter interacting with nucleons through some cross-section as a function of the dark matter mass. And uh, so these sets of curves, I wanna draw your attention to two things. First of all, the Z boson, that typical interaction cross-section is 10 to the minus 39. This is where the experiments are right now. They're actually at the 10 to the minus 46 centimeters squared level. So that has been ruled out by many orders of magnitude. What these experiments are probing right now is the um, regime where dark matter interacts with the standard model via the Higgs boson. And that is kind of this bullseye. Strictly speaking, it actually doesn't close. It continues downward. But eventually, we're going to hit, in the future, looking beyond LZ, which is a xenon experiment um, based out of LBL. We're going to hit the um, atmospheric and solar neutrino backgrounds. And once you get to that point, you don't get linear scaling anymore. You have to now deal with the background of the solar neutrinos and the experiments become very hard. So many people view this as being kind of the practical limitation. On the other hand, you can see that all these experiments have no sensitivity with mass below 10 GeV. And that's partly to do with the way these experiments are, well, it is to do with what, how these experiments were built, but it also has to do with the theory bias that went into that, which said, we don't need to look for dark matter much with mass much, much below 10 GeV. And so there's been a movement to ask the question, how do I look for dark matter, hidden sector dark matter at these much lower mass scales? So fast forward to 2021, Okay. And um, now we've uh, had an explosion of ideas. Uh, and some of these, uh, um, I'll, I'll talk about a few of these, the ones that I think uh, are most likely to succeed, okay? And um, why I think that's the case. But what I wanna highlight here is again, now I'm looking at this window, MEV dark matter. So here's the weak scale. You have the traditional WIMP experiments. You go down another three orders of magnitude and you want to look for electron excitations, okay, with um, now three orders of magnitude improvement in your energy resolution. And then down to KEV, this is basically where dark matter can be populated in some way, not thermally, but in some way through its interaction with the standard model. Uh, now you need no EV energy resolution and the relevant excitations are collective excitations. And this really covers the entire mass range where the abundance being set by its interactions with the standard model is relevant. Okay, so you're with these combination of technologies, you're going to get a huge number of dark matter candidates that you're sensitive to. I want to also comment that for every order of magnitude that you get up here above a KEV, you get another order of magnitude for free. This is you're depositing the kinetic energy. Down here, you're depositing the mass energy. So combined, these experiments are going to hit 12 orders of magnitude in dark matter mass. And because we're um, taking a shot in the dark, you don't want to be in the dark any more than you have to be. You should have a theory that is motivating your search. So to come back to an idea that I said earlier, the dark matter abundance is really providing that guide. So when the dark matter's abundance is fixed by its interaction with the standard model, then that will predict a relic abundance, uh, that will predict a scattering cross-section. So if I have some process where um, annihilation, say, um, allows the relic abundance to be produced, I just turn the diagram on its side, there's a crossing symmetry, 
and it predicts a direct detection cross-section. So here's the interaction cross-section as a function of the mass. There's a lot of detail in these plots. The point that I wanna make is that there's these orange bands and the orange bands correspond to regimes where the interaction with the standard model produces the relic abundance that we observe. So it fixes um, the interaction cross-section in that class of models. So how much time do I have left? I don't have a clock. What? Maybe five or 10 minutes. Okay. So let me race through this and just um, tell you of, of the, if you're gonna get another 12 orders of magnitude in mass, so you're gonna go from the traditional WIMP down to electron volt sensitivity, down to milli electron volt sensitivity, what is it that you have to do in terms of the ideas? So nuclear recoils, literally work like a billiard ball experiment. Dark matter comes in, it scatters off the nucleus, it deposits its kinetic energy, and you can do the non-relativistic kinematics problem. And uh, it turns out that the deposited energy is in the 10 to 100 keV range. And this fact is what uh, really motivates the experimental choices for direct detection of dark matter through elastic scattering off of nuclei that is appropriate for weak scale dark matter. If you wanna go down the next three orders of magnitude down to MEV mass dark matter, then you actually need to look at lighter targets in order to be able to extract more of the dark matter kinetic energy. So um, again, very, you know, stating it very simply, the energy deposited is the momentum transfer squared over the electron mass. And you know the most amount of momentum you can transfer is MV. And so now you um, work that out and uh, MeV dark matter will deposit at most an electron volt of energy because dark matter is moving at 10 to the minus three times C. And so that means good places to look are an ionization of electrons that has about a 10 um, electron volt gap or excitation of electrons from valence to conduction band that has about an electron volt gap. If you, have dark matter now that is dropping below this MEV mass scale, then you have to think about new things entirely. And um, this is where you start to realize that uh, unlike in nuclear recoil experiments where you treat the nucleus as being free, when you look at a nucleus in a typical material, it of course is not free. Uh, and in addition, when the dark matter mass drops below an MEV, it's de Broglie wavelength becomes longer than the interparticle spacing. So that means that I don't just interact with one of, you know, nucleus or one electron, I'm actually interacting with the lattice. Okay, the degrees of freedom in the material change and I need to compute the excitation rate for collective modes. And I would love to go through the details of that. I think I probably don't have time. So I'm just gonna skip ahead and show to you well, I wanna say one more thing that's really cool about these, this um, is that um, you get directional detection. So dark matter, the um, earth, that's what this is, points to the dark matter wind. Dark matter wind goes towards Cygnus and the earth is oriented with respect to Cygnus at some angle, I think it's about 43 degrees if I remember right. And so as we rotate on our axis, the orientation of a dark matter detector with respect to the wind is gonna change as a function of the times of day. And now when I uh, have a process where I excite collective modes in the material, those collective modes are not isotropic, okay? So this is completely different than the standard nuclear recoil case. I have excitation rates now that depend on the time of the day because it matters whether the dark matter particle is coming in this way and exciting a mode or whether it's coming in this way and exciting the mode. And this actually gives rise to an order one variation in the interaction rate in the detector. And because um, it depends in particular on how the detector is oriented with respect to the wind, this is actually a smoking gun signature that would allow you to actually really determine that you're seeing dark matter in your detector and not some other background. So this, um, these combination of technologies together allow you through the scattering process now to get down to this KEV mass window 
Um, so here, I'm, you know, this plot stops at 10 GeV. That's where the WIMP experiments pick up at higher masses. And you can see that with, it, now these detectors are a kilogram, okay, in comparison to the xenon experiments that are ton scale experiments. These are very small experiments. You can cover some of these well-motivated dark matter candidates by actually many orders of magnitude in the interaction cross-section. And so this is uh, one of the major pushes within the um, dark matter direct detection community right now. There are several funded experiments that are moving forward with this idea. Okay, so let me conclude. <laughs> so wanted to make this talk something of a call to really think about ways that you could make uh, measurements of dark matter substructure with in particular halos that have densities which may not be typical of CDM halos. And you're not looking for strange models of dark matter. Okay, I wanna emphasize that this is generic, that on small scales, you expect particle interactions are gonna impact the formation of structure. Okay, so you're, it's, um, it's not as if you're kind of trying to finagle with your dark matter model to get some kind of a signature. This just comes out naturally. Uh, theories of dark matter, okay, I already said this. Theories of hidden sector dark matter in general, just broaden the class of astrophysically relevant signals. And there are opportunities that are um, to measure small scale structure that are maturing now. I think they deserve a lot more study. I mentioned just briefly astrometric and photometric lensing and pulsar timing arrays. And direct detection, even though I didn't get to spend a lot of time on it, is becoming a fast developing area where people are pushing into this low mass um, dark matter regime. And so I, uh, my apologies if you've seen me show this before, uh, because I, I often like to show this when I'm talking about dark matter, which is that sometimes, you know, you can get overwhelmed with the question of what is the, it's a huge problem, what is the nature of the dark matter? And uh, we've made progress. <laughs> We know that the universe has to be dominated by some physics beyond the standard model. We started with these ideas that the dark matter could be a wimp or an axion or actually also, you know, black holes. We've really made progress on, you know, eliminating or strongly constraining those dark matter candidates. And so now we're um, thinking about dark matter in a way actually that is more can say analogous to the standard model in the sense that there's dynamics, okay? And so uh, now we're pushing on this further and asking the question, okay, we have this uh, broad set of candidates. How is it that I develop a broad set of tools to be able to look for all these dark matter candidates? So I think it'll be uh, an interesting time over the next decade to see how this evolves. Uh, and I'm certainly happy to talk more about that. So thank you. Thank you, Catherine, for that incredibly interesting and sort of horizon expanding view of this field. Um, and uh, so we have a lot of work to do to catch up with the theorists, I think, the observers, the experimentalists. Um, are there questions? First of all, if you're in the audience here, you get the first dibs. So. <laughs> Nancy? <laughs> Um, I think uh, the question I asked you was about your past paradigm in the last slide, um, where you mentioned that there's a dependency between the 12.5 year signal being hydrochromatic black hole noises or uh, dark matter phase transition. So, do you need more pulsars, more precision, more years? How, how do we? How do we yeah. So, that's an interesting question. We have not done the study. So, so um, you know, we worked with nanograph to do this analysis just to see if it was consistent. So in general, of course, if you were able to make this measurement across a broad range of frequencies, the um, spectrum looks very different from a supermassive black hole um, you know, scenario because it's peaked with a frequency that's set by the phase transition uh, temperature. So um, if you were just able to get a better handle 
on the frequency spectrum over a broad range of frequencies in particular, that would already be um, because it rises and it falls. <laughs> Whereas um, the SMBHB, they're um, fitting just with a single power law. So um, the question is how hard is that gonna be to do, <laughs> practically speaking? And I don't know the answer to that. Uh, you know, I'm sure that there are experts in this audience who would have a much better idea than I would. George. Uh, I was intrigued by your model of uh, non electromagnetic dissipative that kind of things of creating C black holes of one direction. Yeah. Does so that model also predict the correct radio shape? Distribution yep, on larger scales. So this is the this is one of the keys. Can you repeat the question so that I can't hear So he was asking whether so if you can simultaneously see black holes and not actually uh, create problems for the rest of what we know about dark matter halos. If I can paraphrase your question that way, and the answer is yes. Uh, and um, we looked at that in quite a bit of detail, or I should say, Jacob Huang Yu did. Uh, and the key here, or one of the key ingredients here, is that you're looking at very rare halos. Okay, so most, so the average halo does not experience this effect. And so you only need very, actually, quite rare halos to have this um, occur, this instability occur in order to explain what we see at high redshift. That's the short answer. The, you know, there'd be, there's a much longer answer as well, and I'm happy to talk about that later. Okay. Um, I mentioned the nature of the ultratonic signal. Um, yeah. You mentioned it could be a background or perhaps individual events that can resolve. Yeah. Um, but is there any chance or any likelihood that it's correlated between pulsars? Because I think yeah. we're not going to believe it until we yeah. see the correlation. Yeah, that's right. And um, in general, um, the, the strongest constraints are actually coming from single events. So what we did, we did a variety of <laughs> statistical tests, but the one that turned out to be the strongest, um, at least in certain parts of these, uh, when we call something static or deterministic, what that means is that in that mass range, the most powerful constraint actually looked, came from looking at a single pulsar with this, the single closest event that's coming by. That said, if for example, you can see that this Doppler signal here actually dominates over this whole range, that means I'm pulling on the pulsar and that's a dipole. Okay, so that's very specific. So you should be able to see that. And, and if I have a hope that you'd be able to separate this from a, um, you know, the stochastic background, if that holds now going forward, it's gonna be the combination of, the, of a different frequency dependence because this is actually, um, this accumulates. So it um, doesn't just, depend on T minus T prime, it also depends on T. And so that's also different from a stochastic background. So there are a few different handles that um, if one really dug into it, I hope that one could use those to try to distinguish this type of a signal from the stochastic background. But it is not something that we've dug into yet in detail. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. on this slide, um, uh, uh, there's another method you can uh, that's applicable around roughly once over mass and a decade around it, which is class radio burst. Yep. And it's distinctly different from all the other techniques. Uh, basically, the, the, the you, it's sort of uh, it's lensing, but now you, it, uh, the, fact, the rays that are lensed interfere uh, in the ordinary electromagnetic sense. And you get a uh, 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 fringes that yep. you see the uh, faster papers. I think um, I don't know where I think no signal is would be very, very clear. I don't so know. I think uh, it might have actually been on my black hole plot. Kevin, can you paraphrase the question again? So the so he um, he was saying that uh, fast radio bursts 
uh, basically lensing of it, you can get a fringe pattern from um, a dark matter. You know, usually people are looking at this in the context of astrophysical black holes that would be passing between the, the, the well, fast it, radio burst and us. Yeah, and I thought that actually came in at much lower masses, not at a solar mass. I thought that was actually further down here somewhere. I thought that was what this F was, at much lower mass. The other comment I want to make about that, though, is um, I can look up the exact numbers. But I think that that constraint actually, and many of the lensing constraints also require that the halo be extremely dense, like extremely dense. So even these like axion mini clusters, which are already quite dense, it just wouldn't be able to see them because they're too fluffy, because it's such a small angular um, resolution measurement. And so that is the other part of it that I try to emphasize is that, you know, lensing is very, very powerful for extremely dense objects. So it works well for machos, but in fact, across this whole mass range, but they don't apply at all to these objects because they're just too fluffy. Like even things that are much, much more dense than CDM halos, you can't see with lensing because, because the concentration just isn't high enough. Yeah. Go ahead. So I think th this is probably what you're talking about. Oh, yeah. So the question was whether CMB spectral distortions can be a probe. And the answer to that is absolutely yes. Um, and that's what's shown here. So it's. Um, yeah, I don't know exactly where they are, but um, yes, in this kind of range. So they would be sensitive to larger density perturbations. So again, that's going to correspond to very high, um, very high concentration. And uh, so, you know, in terms of models, theories of dark matter that would create halos that would be dense enough. I mean, even mini clusters are very dense, but they're still not dense enough to be seen. Well, they're on much smaller mass scales, but um, there are some theories that that would probe uh, is the short answer to your question. Yeah. Uh, any more questions in the room? Are there questions online? Yeah, there's one online. Okay. Okay. Uh, from Dylan, do theories of primordial black hole formation from dark matter predict the halo mass slash black hole mass correlation? Can you repeat the question? Do theories of primordial black hole formation from dark matter predict the halo mass black hole mass correlation? A halo mass black hole mass relation. Um, like for galaxies. Not that I'm aware, <laughs> but uh, I. Uh, I have not studied um, primordial black hole formation. And the primary reason for that is that when you look at it from an observational point of view, what you're trying to do is dodge this. So you can dodge this. And in fact, in fact people do try to dodge this. But to me, particle dark matter is just so generic, easy to make. It's a, such a wide range of theories that, you know, I, I just don't see it. You know, of course, you should make sure you completely nail it down. But, you know, it's pretty much covered. It, at least as not being the dominant component of dark matter. Okay. Uh, well, are, are there are no further questions. Let's thank Catherine again and uh, look forward to interacting with her uh, as the days go forward. Hello, Amanti.